Okay. Um, third screencast, second to last. We are um, getting close to the end here, and we come to one of the things in the, in the book of Revelation that is probably um, the most practical of the message and instruction of the letter of Revelation. So we've done a lot with some of the symbols and the prophetic, apocalyptic kind of things that are embedded in the letter and how we understand those things. Um, these sections of praise and worship, we, we started the conversation in class and we're continuing it on. You've got a set of questions that um, I'm asking you to consider and to answer and to kind of play around with as we go from the in-class discussions we were having to this screencast to more of the reading and dialogue we're going to continue to have um, in class. But these sections of praise and worship are probably the most informative as far as the instruction of what Revelation is trying to get us to do, to live, to um, know and teach and embody in in the same kinds of ways that Paul's instructions to live upright and uh, morally or ethically this way or that or whatever. Um, and, it, and it doesn't sound like that, and that sounds kind of weird and odd and a bit absurd. Um, but we're going we're gonna to come at that by, by way of a couple of things. And so first, I want to go back and remind you <laughs> the, the text of Revelation, it's an odd kind of letter, but it's a letter, and there's instruction in it for what we need to consider. And one of the, the, well, the consistent idea that we keep coming back to as we look at the text of Revelation is this idea of perspective. Okay. So in the conquering and in the ruling, the perspective is in the contrast and the juxtaposition of true power and authority and wielding it like Rome or sacrificial surrender like the Lamb. It's in that contrast that we find that, that answer. The perspective in the Lamb and the perspective in who he is in that image is embedded in the, the, the heavenly context, right? This pulling back and revealing. We, we expect the all hail, the conquering hero, the lion of Judah, and the, the king like David, the root of David, and we get the lamb. And it's that contrast between the expectation of this grand figure and a lamb. Well, when we get to the passages of praise, our primary consideration is the perspective. And because of that, we pay attention to the location. So first, and, and we started picking up on this a bit in class as we were going through our conversation. Uh, we're looking at chapter 4, okay, in the beginning of chapter 4, and um, we're, we're going to focus on the praise here in, in verse 8 for a quick second, but I, wanna, I want us to pay attention to location because throughout the text of Revelation, when praise and worship is offered, Revelation is clear. It's in heaven or it's before the throne, okay? And, and we're going to see that with the living creatures and the elders who all bow down and offer their crowns. Um, location matters a bit. Um, praise is offered in heaven. It's offered before the throne and around it. And um, there's a great many figures and groups and individuals. There's this huge variety of all the different people and creatures and angels and multitudes and individuals who offer the praise. And so it doesn't seem like who offers the praise, maybe with the exception of just how many offer it. Um, it's more on uh, where that's happening, how it's happening, and on who is the focus of the worship. And so the focus seems to be less on who offers it, but more on where it's offered, when it's offered, and who's the focus of that worship? So we're going to start with um, a bit of the obvious ones, is the who is worshipped. In the text of Revelation, there are two figures that are worshipped. The one seated on the throne and the lamb. And that's about it. John even has this encounter with an angel who's great and mighty, and he 
falls on his face before the angel. And the angel says, whoa, 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 no, don't worship me. That's reserved for God. Okay, that, that's the consistency of the worship in the text of Revelation. There is a contrast to that, but we're going to get to that, that contrast a little bit later as we actually look at the, the, the sort of function in the book of what's going on here. But we're going to stay with this perspective for a minute. So it seems like what we're getting in these sections of, of praise, especially because they're offered before the throne or they're offered in heaven or something to that effect, what, what it looks like, what, what strikes me is that this is some kind of declaration of the heavenly reality. That regardless of what it looks like on the earth, regardless of what it looks like in the empire of Rome, what it looks like to be under the corruption and oppression and the power and the authority of, of the Roman world on this earthly level, the heavenly reality and the heavenly truth is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And that is to come, given all of the events that Revelation plays out for us, that is to come seems to invoke this kind of hope for not only um, deliverance, like we've talked about with the church um, in our class conversations especially, but this hope that the corruption and the oppression uh, and the power the, the twisted form of power that is in the Roman world will be brought to an end. And the is to come is this future ushered in reality where, where what we see in these glimpses of heaven and before the throne of God are our realities forever and ever and ever. Chapters 21 and 22, it seems. But true worship always makes that hope for future, culminated, all the time, perfected reality possible here and now. And so I think part of what these sections of praise and worship are doing is saying, listen, this is the truth and the heavenly reality, and this is the hope held out for us that even as we struggle and we die <laughs> for the confession of our faith, um, it's not just this pie-in-the-sky future hope for glory we make that heavenly reality part of our reality as we engage and participate in what happens before the throne. The heavenly reality is God and the Lamb are worthy of praise and worship. They're worthy of glory and honor and power and the kingdom. They're worthy to rule and open the scroll, and salvation is theirs. All of this that we, we have talked about in class a bit as we read those passages together. Um, authority belongs to them, and greatness belongs to them. When, when we join the hosts of heaven, the living creatures, and the elders, and the angels, and the, the witnesses, and all, all of these people who, who, in the text of religion, who offer this worship, when we join that, we join this song where the realities of heaven are in some sense our realities because we live with this perspective that salvation and power, the kingdom, glory, and authority belong to God and his Christ. And that brings us to this as a matter of perspective. The focus, the perspective of the content of these sections of praise and worship is ultimately about the identity of, of God and the Lamb. They are the only ones who are worthy. They are the ones to whom salvation and power and glory and might and honor belong. They are. It's this, this, these statements of identity. Only they are worthy because only they are these things who was and is and is to come. The first and the last. The king of the kingdom. And this is how we see this playing itself out. Location and perspective. Worship in Revelation is offered before the throne in heaven. 
John, when he describes uh, seeing these scenes in the heavenly spaces, he says, I was in the spirit. And it brings to mind for me, Jesus' comment to the woman at the well of Samaria in the gospel of John, where he says, true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And I think that's part of the reality here. This location and perspective is that those who worship in the Spirit and in truth join what we see in Revelation is this heavenly perspective, this grand worship of God as it's intended. And part of the hope and the promise held out for us as we get to chapter 22 is that not only is our earthly reality here and now, it will be our future reality forever. And it's hope that this God we worship is everything we say he is. It's declarative that this is my God in all of his grandeur and greatness. He will be that forever because he was that, he is that, and he is that to come. And that that's kind of the the idea here. Um, in style, a little bit of a shift, in style, a lot of these sections of praise, especially this idea of um, the new song in, in chapter 5, verse 9. Um, highlight that here real quickly. Uh, and they sang a new song is a throwback to some of the psalms, right? Um, if, I, if memory serves me correctly, I think Psalm 89 highlights this idea. Sorry, it's Psalm 96. Um, highlights this idea, Psalm 96. of um, And they sang a new song. In this case, this new song has lamb overtones. And so um, what was in chapter 4, this focus on the one who's seated on the throne, in chapter 5 now becomes this joint focus. <laughs> God is praised, right? The kingdom of priests to our God, and they'll reign on the earth. But it's the lamb who's worthy. It's the lamb who's worshipped. Right? The, The living creatures and the elders, they fall down before him. And they offer their worship and their praise. And these stylized uh, pieces of praise and worship in the text of Revelation calls back to mind these sections like Psalm 96 and some of the other psalms. It calls back to mind the Exodus 15 song of uh, Miriam and Israel as they've crossed the Red Sea and he's ransomed them and redeemed them and brought them out of their oppression in Egypt. Uh, In a very similar sort of historic context, these sections of praise seem to be seem to be calling to mind the same kinds of things. Um, And so that brings us a little bit to the the function here, which is the the bulk of, I think, what we're going to talk about in this um, screencast. And so number one, um, the echoes of those First Testament praise sections are intentional, I think. And, And they're there for us to to remember that, number one, those who belong to God, to the Lamb, to the kingdom of priests that has been uh, made by uh, the the Lamb slain, that that part of what we're purposed for is worship and praise. And it's more than just singing these songs. And we're going to come back to that. It's more than that. It's this full scope. The the totality of these living creatures and the elders and the the beings in heaven and around the throne, the the whole of their being is consumed with offering worship to God and to the Lamb and laying down their crowns and offering incense. And the, the, the whole of them is just consumed by this worship. And so I, I think this is one of those reminders like the songs of our First Testament and in our Psalter, that that we are, in in some sense, intended and purposed to to worship God in in this kind of totality. Um, 
and and that involves what we see a lot of in the in the in the text of Revelation is that, that these songs will very very often, especially in like chapter eleven and in uh, chapter nineteen, they they well and in chapter five for sure they they start to tell this story right. Um, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God. That is giving worship and praise and declaring something about, about Jesus as the Lamb here. But it's also retelling the story of the crucifixion, the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection. And we're going to see it again in chapter 12, right? The living creatures and the elders and many angels. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. It's part of the story. It's who the Lamb is. It's this identity and story coexisting in these sections of praise. Um, they're focused on that. That's the, that's the thrust of these things. They function, it, it seems, in the text of Revelation at these really strategic points to move us along in the vision, in, in the, the story of Revelation, if you will, the story of the letter. But while it moves us from, from this section of the vision to that section of the vision, from this moment in um, history and redemption and hope for future glory to the next thing or whatever that is, um, from the judgments against the kingdom that opposes God to the promises held out for those who are in the kingdom of the Lamb, while, while it shifts us from those things and, and transitions us in the storyline, it keeps this strong and centralized focus on God and the Lamb. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, chapter 5, verse 13, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Then they say amen and they fall down and they worship. It's this, These sections of praise and worship are these powerful moments of declarative statements about the identity of God and the identity of the Lamb while they keep us moving along. In the, they, these are the, the moments of movement and the moments of storytelling in, in the visions we see. So here's kind of what I think they're doing functionally and structurally in the text of the book. Number one, um, as a, as a device in the letter, the, the sections of praise move us along in the story of God's salvation being shown to us here in the text of Revelation. I think that's, I think that's first. Um, they, they, they serve to keep us going in the story of God's salvation for his people, his judgments, uh, his... Um, his activity, but it, it serves as we move from one section of God's activity to the next to recenter, to refocus us, to pull us back and keep the focus on him, not on the things he's doing, on God, not on the things God is doing, on the lamb, not on the stuff the lamb is doing. I think that's kind of what's happening here. In these, in these sections. And so it moves us along. It transitions us from this period of activity to the next, all the while keeping our focus on who God is, who the Lamb is, and why they are so awesome and worthy of glory and honor and praise and all the rest of that. So then, where in the text do we see these? Well, we've looked at a couple of them in chapter 4 and in chapter 5. Um, and I may not sort of walk you to all the places and spaces. We're going to look at a couple um, here in a minute, but um, I may not walk you to all the specific references, but I'm going to talk about them as best as I can, um, keeping in mind we're halfway through a 30 or 35-minute screencast already, and so I'm trying to cram as much into this as I can. So number one, in, in chapters four and five, we're introduced in the heavens, we're introduced to God and the Lamb. And and this cements our focus on them before we start getting into their activity. We've received the um, glorified Christ's instructions in chapters 2 and 3 to the churches, and we've been held out 
uh, punishments and promises and all of that. And now we get a glimpse. This is the reality of that glorified Christ as the Lamb. This is the reality of God who's seated on the throne. And, and this cements what the rest of the book is going to take off with. Because this is God. And this is the Lamb. And now we can start moving the, into what's going to happen. How it's going to unfold. Kind of, right? Symbolically, perhaps. Um, but the focus up front and the focus first is on this is the greatness and the glory of, of God and the Lamb. And after chapter 5 and the, the praise for God in chapter 4 who's seated on the throne and the Lamb in chapter 5, we get into chapter 6. And chapter 6 is the seals on the scroll. The Lamb is opening, right? Um, because only the Lamb is worthy to open the seven seals here. And so in chapter 6, now we're looking at the seals and the activity of God as each of the seals is opened. So we get that in 6. And then in chapter 8, we get the trumpets, right? Um, but sandwiched in between there is chapter 7. And, and chapter 7 has as a, um, a strong focus, right, are, uh, is, is this worship, right? Verse 10, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb who has secured that salvation for them. And the angels standing around the throne and the elders and living creatures, they fall on their faces before and they worship God, saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and glory and power be to our God forever and ever. Here it is. As we transition as we move from one moment of God's activity to another section of God's activity, we get these sections of praise in chapter 7. They're moving us along, but what are they doing? They're maintaining our focus, right? They serve him day and night. Right? They worship him, and he will be their shepherd and guide them and lead them, okay? And, and their entire task is to cry out with a loud voice. This great multitude that no one can number is to worship with palm branches in their hands and cry out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is us. This is where we can interject ourselves into the story. Those who belong. Those who are the great multitude. Those who are the people of God. Yeah. who've been gathered, the, the first little piece in, in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 7. Now, this is what we do. We join with the reality of heaven in chapters 4 and 5, and we offer this worship. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, and we join with the hosts of heaven in singing this praise. Our focus is on what? It's on God. It's on the Lamb. It's on what He has done, and we are offering worship and glory and honor to Him as we move in the literature here, as we move from one section of God's activity to the next section of God's activity, the people of God are focused on God. Right? We're going to see that again in chapter 11. Right? There are the two witnesses called. Right? And in the last half of 11, the angel blows his trumpet and there's a loud voice in heaven. Right? And then in 16, the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fall on the face and they worship. And here's what they say. We give thanks to you who was and is and is to come, taking your great power and begun to reign. We're looking at worship. Now we're telling a little bit of the story as well in here. Right? But your wrath came. Time for the dead to be judged. You're rewarding your servants, those who fear your name, and destroying the destroyers of the earth. Punishment on those who are not of the kingdom and rewarding those promises of blessing for those who are, right? And so as we move between the trumpets and the bowls of God's wrath, okay, uh, and we move out of the witnesses in 11 and into the promises for the church to rule with God, again, that's my take on chapter 12, right? Uh, we get this section of praise where the 
elders in heaven who sit on their thrones before God fall on their faces and they worship. And that's going to be joined in chapter 12, verse 11. Okay, and a verse 10, a loud voice in heaven saying, now the, salvation, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He accuses them day and night. They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. And then verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Those who've been caught up in verse 5, right? To be with him and rule and reign with him. Well, Where's the focus here? This is what has been done for us. This is the greatness. This is all belongs to our God. And he's worthy of that worship. As we move between these sections of judgment and intensity coming from the heavenly perspective of what God is doing, the trumpets and the bulls of wrath, this in 11 and 12 is also right before all of this about the dragon and the beasts and this terrifying imagery of what is, what is this and what is going on? Where's the focus of those who belong? It's on God and the Lamb because we belong to the kingdom of the Lamb. It's going to show up again in chapter 15 after the announcement of judgments against the kingdoms of the world who are unrepentant. And then again in chapter 19 in um, probably one of the most clearly First Testament-like passages, chapter 19. After the great judgment on Babylon, we get this song of praise from the multitude in heaven. Chapter 7, it seems, right? Crying out, offering praise and worship to God. Salvation and glory, power, they belong to our God for his judgments are true and just. And now they're telling the story. He's judged the great Babylon, the prostitute, the corrupted, the oppressor, the opposition to his kingdom. Right? He's reigning. And those who belong to him in this multitude, 19 verse 6, right? The Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. And then the story continues, now focused on the people. Now the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. As the story moves along in the activities of God, uh, punishing those who oppose him and holding out promise and and rescue, and um, the marriage of the Lamb for those who belong to the kingdom of the Lamb. We are invited to join with the hosts of heaven and the elders who stand before the throne and praise and worship God and the Lamb because only they are worthy of it. And, and as the storyline moves along in Revelation, the focus of these sections of praise and worship and glory and all of, it's it's all focused on who they are and why they are so awesome and so worthy of honor and glory and praise. And the invitation here is for us to join in that praise and sing with the hosts of heaven. But it's not just about the song. It's not just about the song. There's this little pop-up in chapters 13 and 14 of false worship, idolatry. And there's the warnings in the letters in chapters 2 and 3 of avoiding the idolatry and the temptation to fall prey to the lure of false worship. To remain faithful to what we've seen in heaven, to what has been revealed to us, the curtain pulled back to see the truth here. These literary sections of praise in Revelation should inspire in us a life of worship, a life that sings for the glory and majesty of God. What we see revealed, disclosed to us, Revelation. What we see there should inspire our lives of praise in spirit 
and in truth. It's not about singing the words and the song. It's about offering self in worship to God. Right? The questions begged, asked of us in these sections of praise are a lot. And they're crammed into these spaces. One of them is, who is God and who is the Lamb? Why should we praise God and the Lamb? All of that is answered by the, by the who. We, we give them praise because of who they are. King of the kingdom. The Holy One. The Righteous One. The ones to whom belong salvation and honor and authority and majesty and power. Because all of creation owes itself to God and the Lamb. Next question is, do those sections of worship, does this mentality of praise and joining with heaven in its praise to God impact how we live? Does it impact the way we struggle with the things that we feel oppress us and press on us and crush us to some extent? Salvation and honor and authority and glory and majesty and power belong to him, to God and to the Lamb. Are we, here and now, the bride making herself ready, giving glory and honor to God and the Lamb? We've talked about this idea of conquering and ruling quite a bit, both in the screencast really condensed, but also we've really unpacked that in our, in our discussions in class. And so now we ask this question as we come to these sections of worship. And, and I honestly have this question of the text. Are the, are the sections here in praise and worship, are these illustrations and examples for us as how we ought to live as those who rule and reign with Christ? And I think the answer is yes. The, these Sexual uh, sections here, these, these selections of praise and worship and the storytelling of the grand salvation of God and what he has done for us, these should be our testimony. 12 verse 11, right? We, we, we keep coming back to that verse, right? They overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. I think these sections of praise in the, the storyline of the letter of Revelation need to be our life testimony. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Do we declare that with the way that we live? It begs the question. If, if I'm going to sing that song of praise, the Lord God Almighty reigns. If I'm going to sing the worthy is the Lamb or the holy, 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 if I'm going to sing that, is that how I live? this multifaceted, multi-layered issue in Revelation starts to, this is what starts to seep into how this praise and worship stuff works. This is what worship looks like. And so now that becomes the, is this what our worship looks like? Do I offer him praise and worship as a kind of lip service? Or is the testimony I sing and join in in these praise sections of Revelation the testimony of my life? Offering worship and glory and authority. Ascribing the greatness of salvation and power and majesty to him. I think part of the statement of these worship sections in the text of Revelation is quite simply this. The conquering church is the worshiping church. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. This is what God has done. And the word of their testimony, our testimony, should sound a lot like the worship of Revelation. This is how awesome and great and majestic this is my God. But it should be more than just what I say. 
It should be how I live. My life should declare the praises of God. Right? The marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Right? It was granted her to clothe herself with linen, fine linen, bright and pure. And then it says this, For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. This is our worship. It's the way we live. I'm going to leave you with these questions. Is our testimony, your testimony, one of worship in all of the areas of your life? Are we the worshiping church? 